All right, so uh, Truth team from uh, OCTV, we have no idea what we're going to be doing today. Uh, so guys, let us know. Uh, no, uh, that's the good, that's going to be the first stream for, uh, for 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 today. What we plan to do is to uh, talk a bit about the latest news that was uh, that were happening this week. Uh, the main reason is every week we do a show that is called OMG, so Overclocking Mod Gaming, where we speak about uh, the latest uh, trends and stuff. And we have uh, usually we have guests and so on. So this week we did not do that show, so we'll be doing it today. So if there's any special topics that you guys want to uh, want to do or see, let us know. Overclocking that Kingpin card, we keep that for the end. So we. Uh, we will uh, we will try to do it in a, in a way. So let's do it. OMG team. Yeah. OMG this week. I can't remember if it's like the seven or eighth one. Uh, it should be. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter. So yeah. So actually, so, I think so the yeah. main news is that we are, we are here at PAX. Um, PAX this year. I haven't seen any major announcement here at PAX uh, in terms of a hardware release or anything like that. But. Um, I hear that there are some companies that are sort of like showcasing some stuff, so um, not too sure actually what it's going to be, but uh, it sounds like there, there's something behind the scene happening. Um, okay, so let's start with PAX. What is yeah. your highlight at PAX? It's been two days we are here. Uh, what have you seen that you think that people would be happy to hear about? Uh, so what I like about it is um, mostly all the cosplays been some pretty uh, crazy and really good one uh, that I've seen around the show floor um, the best one was the Minecraft one so it's kind of like a guy dressed in the Minecraft cubes kind of thing um, and it's really tall it's not like you think it's a, just a man size it's actually twice the size of a regular person and uh, that person is just walking around and bumping into stuff and, and there's another guy behind with a hammer and everything so it's really hilarious and uh, this one is one of the best one I've seen so far. Cool. Um, I saw the Kirby this morning. Uh, yeah. Where actually, yeah. I, I found this one uh, pretty funny. Um, let's get to it. Uh, what's the first thing you want to talk about? Um, so let's see. I'm uh, I'm checking what are the 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 fancy and cool news uh, right now out there. Uh, so it seems Apple canceled their air power, air power charger. So that's um, that's one of the news. That's bad. I'm just googling it good. right now. So I'm trying to figure out what what the heck happened this week. I wonder actually. They are charging it around for so long. Uh, it's funny that some guys still. Mm. It is funny because everyone on the live chat is saying like, "Hey, talk about Ryzen 3000, blah blah blah. Hey, talk about upcoming new stuff." No, we can't. We don't know. We don't know anything. I just hear the same rumors that everybody heard. I mean, we you know we read the same news site as you guys, and you know we yeah, we so you know hear the same rumors and, and things going on, and we have heard good things. I mean, we have read good things as well, and the thing is, uh, we don't know. Wait for the benchmark, as usual. You know, it's like stadium. Wait for the benchmark, even though we won't be able to do the benchmark, but that's that's okay. Oh yeah, there's uh, this cool news. Have you seen that uh, robot from uh, Boston Dynamics? Since we're in Boston, sort of relates to it. Let me check if we have the video here. Uh, what this? Can uh, you switch to the screen? Where's the face cam, crowd cam, crowd cam? Just a different scene, maybe. Yeah. Well, I can't. S I can't see it. Yeah, it's uh, over there on the uh, other screen. Damn it. Card cam, face cam. <laughs> okay, we're trying to figure out how the OBS is configured here. Oh yeah, what about the Valve VR headset? That's something we can talk about as well, actually. Uh, so I only saw the news yesterday uh, when I was checking some stuff. Oh, Can you cut the sound? Yes, I can. There Thanks. we go. So, uh, so st speak about that, and we're gonna talk to the VR one. All right. So, Boston Dynamics wait, let me, uh, is a uh, is a company that's uh, actually very well known. They do all those uh, crazy robots, uh, the scary ones, the one that looked like a cheetah, and the uh, other one that looks like a they call it I don't know, like a dog with a, like a snake head or something like that that can open doors. So now they have a new one that looks like a chicken. Uh, 
Uh, and it's uh, apparently pretty good at moving boxes, so it can pick up boxes. And it has this kind of like, uh, it looks like a suction head or something like that, that uh, sticks to the top of the box and uh, lifts them up. Uh, so yeah, I think there's a... And, and I wonder how, you know, how heavy can that actually be controlled? Uh, it doesn't say in the video, but I would have to sort of look it up online how, how that works. Uh, definitely something, it's a bit scary. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it opens all the usual questions about people losing their jobs and things <laughs> like that. So say they can handle up uh, boxes of up to 15 kilos, so 33 pounds. Uh, I need that to clean my room. That's actually a pretty good one. Hey, if it can lift 15 kilos, it can move pieces around. So could yeah. be uh, could be useful in some uh, some cases. That's it. Some cases, but a point. All right, uh, H uh, not HTC. Uh, Valve announced a new VR headset. Yes. Uh, we heard the news yesterday, but as we were here on PAX East, we didn't have a lot of time to catch up with that. But basically, Valve VR. So it looks like it's uh, a little bit of improvement from what was before. We can see there's uh, two cameras as well uh, in front. So maybe there's going to be VR yeah, yeah. with um, special positioning. So like scanning your room with uh, whatever is going on around that. Um, supposedly May 2019, as we know, Valve always have this special way of releasing things. So we will see. Uh, if that's actually can uh, be interested, well who's producing this one? Do we know? No idea. Uh, doesn't really. There's not really any news about it. The only thing you know is that it has to suit cameras. It seems to have this kind of like a closed-up uh, face, so it looks really similar in some ways to the Oculus, at least from the front, without the cameras. Um, you can adjust the what they think is the adjustment for the eye. So basically, every person has different um, di uh, different distance between the eyes, so you can adjust that, and uh, that's something that is a bit of a problem for some people uh, on the on the uh, regular heads, uh, like uh, VR headsets. I uh, think the le button there is here is kind of like a power button, I suppose. Uh, must be or something. Maybe that's like that. a, a quick launch for Alt Five Three VR. Oh, maybe you can. Oh, that that would be cool. Actually, that would be. What do you guys think? If uh, Valve would be to release Half Life, the next one, three, would it be a VR only game? Would it be as cool uh, as it would be a PC game as it is, like a regular desktop game? Yeah, I wouldn't actually mind actually. It would make it. If Valve wanted to really push and promote their VR headsets, uh, having Half Life Three only come out in VR would probably be uh, one of the things that would make sort of uh, sense and bring appeal to the headset. I'm always convinced that VR is never going to take off if there are not amazing exclusive titles just for it. Just the same way people uh, either started buying a PlayStation or started buying an Xbox. Uh, in many cases, just because the games are just available there and people want to play the game so they get a console or whatever. Mm. So Actually, yep. that's, uh, that's true from... Uh IoT cool. The Half Life was always been a demonstration for Valve for their like game engine. Yeah. So if they do a game engine, especially for VR, that's gonna be pretty interesting to see that. Uh, the thing is, they have they had the Va the HTC, HTC Vive, but the the way that now it's Valve, uh, we'll see how that actually turn uh, turns out. The, the the main concern now we have is the adoption of VR. I mean VR is we hear that oh, VR is everywhere. Blah blah blah. It's okay. There's a lot of people that have VR headset or VR compatible system. The thing is, how many of you actually have VR right now? The the main issue with VR, it's a very personal experience. So it's something you really keep for yourself, and because you're usually alone, I mean, it's it's hard to have enough VR headset and PC to run that and play a game at home with friends. Uh. So it's very good for a lot of oh, for a lot of uh, usage, like training and uh, in shop experience. Um, like safety trainings are the best one for that, uh, but you're very closed up. Um, well, I you personally think that AR and MR, like uh, augmented reality and mixed reality, are actually path to the future, uh, not for games but for uh, mass adoption and mass usage. While VR will stay on the on the game side in a very specific environment, so you can wipe out the regular environment and just put like a virtual one all the way. I think it it also depends what's the game like. Um I, I do think a game like Half-Life in, in VR, I mean as a VR full completely just VR game, 
would, would make sense because it's sort of like a, a type of game where you sort of completely immerse in there and it would bring a, another dimension. Then again, you could have some kind of similar dimension um, as far as game experience goes with just the, the regular desktop uh, game experience. But um, yeah. Uh, and and uh, wireless. That's actually a good point that was brought up by the chat as well. Is uh, it, having is it, it wireless. Maybe mm. it is wireless. We don't know. But I would doubt that. I don't know, really. Like, uh, so far, um, the problem with wireless for VR is mostly latency. Um, I mean, we can stream or send video feeds in 4K already across Wi Fi very well. Mm. The problem is that uh, the latency of either the encoding and then the decoding in the headset. Uh, other problem also of doing that wireless is just the battery life because it's you, if you end up having to do all those um, either decoding of video feeds that are sent over Wi-Fi or whatever, if you add cameras on the VR headsets, if you have all, all those kinds of sensors, maybe better screens and all those things, um, you end up basically running a computer on your front, uh, on your forehead. So you have to power that somehow. And uh, VR headsets are already heavy enough as they are. Uh, I mean, like most of them, you do have that strap on top, right? That is sort of resting on top of your head. Um, so it doesn't really make it um, yet something that is convenient enough in a, in a fully wireless mode. So, But it, it's going to get there for sure. I mean, like when you see this, the kind of batteries we get in the smartphones, uh, the kind of performance you get out of smartphones as well for rendering and things, uh, definitely would work. Uh, but uh, uh, wireless for VR is not, not there yet. Um, especially another thing uh, with VR is that the computation, in this case the game rendering, is done uh, still by computer on the side. So uh, if you wanted to completely remove the whole, uh, the whole latency out of the uh, VR equation, you would have to ultimately do everything straight on the headset. And uh, maybe, I mean, if we're talking about Valve, we have all this uh, st steam everywhere kind of stuff. Why not? Uh, why would it not make sense that basically, uh, just like um, Valve is already planning, or Steam is already planning, that you play your games from remote screens anywhere in your home, while the VR headset is just one of those remote screens. And if they, if they can actually eventually pull this off, it would, it would be amazing. Uh, I would just question the latency at this point. Um, if, you're, if, if it's anything for non-latency uh, uh, intensive tasks, like uh, watching a film in VR, watching content, or um, any kind of other applications, I'm not going to go into the porn debate here, but uh, it's another one. Not something I think Steam is going to advocate for, but it's one of them, um, because that's probably one of the biggest use cases for VR nowadays. Uh, it would definitely be um, something there. Actually, uh, a lot of people are actually not happy with the game streaming, like uh, Stadia and so on, and Steam anywhere. Yes. Um, well, th this is all on the table yeah. nowadays. It's like a, it's a question for people. It's like what's going to happen to PC gaming as we know it, and we had a whole stream about that already. It's um, it's going to change a lot of things, and if they get, uh, if they fix the latency problem, then it's definitely going to be a game changer. And um, yeah, we'll see where that goes. Um, All right. Did you saw that video of that guy that spent uh, five days in VR or something like that? I heard about it. I haven't watched it yet. So did, you, a, did you? Yeah. So I, I, I watched the... Uh, he made a recap video. Apparently he was streaming the whole experience on, on Twitch as well. I was not aware of it. Otherwise I would have checked it out. Uh, the guy was basically living 24 hours a day. So even during the night wearing his uh, VR headset. Um, and uh, he was just doing that the, the whole time, trying to sort of like uh, eat at the same time <laughs> and working. So he had his uh, basically his uh, monitors of his desktop PC also played into the VR whatever field of view in the in the headset. It was like, <laughs> what, the, what the heck is going on here? Uh, interesting experience. Um, his takeaway of it was that basically the real world has way better pixel density than uh, the VR world. Um, he didn't really mention too much like uh, eye stress or things like that. So you do uh, eventually get used to it. Uh, but yeah, that's, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't do it, obviously. I, I, I won't be able to do that. And I don't want to do that. Um, uh, what a few guys, what of most of you guys have been saying on the, on the live chat is that um, there's need to have proper games for proper adoption and the price need to be low enough for people to afford it so the cost of entry is actually a very important factor for that 
and there is quite a few things that uh, that are still remain to be answered. Uh, so far, the adoptions, yes, there's a lot of people with VR headset, but that's not a mass market yet. No, the, uh, the people that have the most VR gear are PlayStation users. Yep. Like uh, the you know the like the two like uh, the two handles that look like a like a lollipop thing or something. I don't know whether who the fuck came up with that. And then um, and uh, like the PSVR thing. I think th those are like the. It's the most used VR headset, but then again, the the quality of it and the kind of images you get is nothing like what a PC user would want to have. It's fine for maybe people that people that are used to console graphics, but if you are like a, uh, a PC graphics guy and you like really high detail, high texture, high resolution kind of images, um, yeah, there's nothing there out there. And I think if even uh, Valve comes with this uh, headset out. They will have to price it ultra aggressively to sort of make it that's so something that people want to buy. Because otherwise, yeah. Or maybe bundled with Half-Life 3 and... Buy Half-Life 3. Uh, and if, you you get if you tell me for 250 bucks you have a VR headset and a Half-Life 3, I think makes it an okay purchase because the game maybe is worth 60 bucks. And yeah, <laughs> you why not? I mean, it, it might be okay. But other than that, I don't, I don't think people would pay more than that, really. I'm trying to install the uh, the software for later to because we're gonna try to overclock the system after uh -huh. the show, so I'm trying to find everything there. Um, is there any other uh, specific topic that you think are worthy to discuss this week? Ah, so let me think about it. The 2080 Ti Kingpin Edition is interesting, very interesting card, uh, and I have to say uh, the the design and the takes on it are actually pretty uh, pretty interesting to look at. That's gonna be um, by the end of the show that we will be, uh, will be uh, going a little bit deeper into that. Uh, in terms of, um, so we talk about VR and so on, but mostly for gaming, Steam Anywhere uh, was the take from Steam to actually just do that. You can stream your game to any of your devices from your own PC uh, to do that. And that was released just before S Google Stadia was announced. And I, I wonder if any of you guys actually have already tried that and what is your take on that and otherwise uh, we haven't test yet uh, what i do expect is that the requirement for your internet connection will be the m biggest limiting factor anyway so we we already can expect that from the uh, from the situation uh, what are our thought on the gtx 1650 i can't say i haven't got one and i haven't seen benchmark yet because i did not have the time to look into it because well we can't say anything so far. Oh, and by the way, uh, for all the people that just join us, uh, I'm Truthman from Overclocking TV. This is Xiala from Overclocking TV. We are not from EVGA. We just took over the stream. And I heard there's some kind of like secret words that you guys may need to know. Well, basically that's this. Looks like this. And yeah, so team. Uh, we had a panel yesterday yes. about PC building, and uh, that's a good transition to what we're going to be doing later down the no, later down the road. Um, can you tell us more about what happened yesterday here at PAX East? Uh, so yesterday, um, like you mentioned, we had a panel. Um, the idea behind it was to sort of like have a nice uh, discussion with uh, the crowd out here at PAX uh, to discuss PC building in general, not taking any size or any like. Um, brand representation or anything like that. It was mostly to just discuss about um, how do you build a PC, what kind of components do you put in there. And we had a lot of interesting questions about people coming from different uh, different paths of slice and different kinds of budgets. So you have always uh, people that are maybe on a, on a small budget to buy, build a gaming rig, so they have uh, specific questions related to that. Um, we had also a few questions about workstations. It seems like there are also people attending packs that are creators uh, that are doing a lot of works like in CAD and um, rendering things or maybe content creators like YouTubers, etc. So those people have uh, completely different needs than most of the, um, the, the gaming crowd out there. So it was quite nice. It was very diverse uh, on stage. Um, so there were four panelists. Uh, the idea was to build at the same time that we were doing the discussion. Um, built two systems. So one of them was a mini ITX system um, with the 1660 Ti uh, Z the H370 uh, EVGA motherboard. Um, there was some Corsair all-in-one coolers in there, and also a Corsair SFX uh, power supply. 
Um, nice thing about that system, we also used a, a Streetcom DA2 case, so um, that's a very tiny, compact uh, mini ITX case, um, which has this interesting like uh, way of mounting motherboard uh, onto some kind of uh, racks inside, which can slide uh, back and forth. Uh, so that was an interesting build experience. Um, I was with uh, Eric Hobbs, uh, another guy that is a small fun form factor fan uh, to build that case. So we um, we did one sort of the panel in a way that our PC was done building before the other team's PC. Uh, so that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, we did have some struggles at some point uh, mounting the graphics card in there because we ended up having um, a two slot uh, 1660 Ti cards, but uh, which was a regular, not a... Uh, not a like a small form factor version of the card. So this one basically we ended up having to um, to to move away some of the cables or some of some of the things inside the, the case to fit everything. But it ended up fitting very well. Uh, might not have been the best um, cooling airflow, but uh, definitely the PC was uh, working and finished building. Um, the other team, um, so they were on the ATX side, so like a full sized PC. Uh, they were using the Z390 Dark uh, motherboard from EVGA uh, in a 9900K CPU. Uh, those guys uh, also use Corsair memory as well as uh, some 850 watt Corsair PSU and they had the same all-in-one cooler uh, that we had as well. Uh, so they, they uh, seem to do very well as well. Of course, building a PC in a full-size uh, ATX case uh, it's a little bit easier in a way that you don't have to really struggle so much uh, with the space uh, and you don't have to think out so much which uh, in which order are you going to bring in the components into the system. So um, that's one of the advantages and if you are not too used to build PCs, ATX cases, not necessarily ATX form factor motherboards, but ATX cases is something that makes sense because you're going to have more space to move things around, less risks of uh, maybe errors or damaging things it's, it's a, if it's a little bit tight. Um, now then again, you can always take an ATX case and a maybe a micro ATX or a completely small small size motherboard. I think micro ATX is a good deal. Uh, it's the best I, I do personally like micro yeah, ATX more than the full size ATX. Nobody I know that has ATX motherboards use all the PCI Express slots and even if people argue to you like oh yeah but so it has uh, more space so I have more upgradeability in the future uh, the days of SLI the days of Crossfire all this kind of like over nowadays it's not something people do so much anymore um, and there are people that still run two GPUs but sometimes they use just one for uh, stream rendering uh, if they use uh, NVIDIA for, for their, pro their transcoding and things like that and then the other one for uh, the gaming graphics card. Uh, and those are people that basically upgraded graphics card and ended up keeping the uh, previous card that they had. Uh, but besides that, I think most people don't need to, to have all those five PCI Express slots. I mean, it does look cool to have them, but uh, they don't really serve any purpose. Um, micro ATX is good for that because it's kind of like a mix in between and most micro ATX board also have all the same features that you find on the whole sized ATX board, there's not really any difference. So you have the same kind of uh, audio things on board, you have all the same outputs for the IOs of the motherboard, uh, you find the same chipset so you end up with the same CPU and component features that you have. Um, memory wise, there's the same amount of modules you can, can connect in, so if you have a Z390 uh, Z3, uh, boards, uh, you can put yeah, your four DIMM slots on there. If you have a dark board, you only have two on there at the top, but I mean that's uh, EVGA specific. Um, and then, I mean, there's not really any difference. So I, I'd go for that. It gives you more space. And also if you want to do water cooling as well, it's kind of like, a, it's nice to have a space in the case to put in your reservoirs, put in your pumps. And um, of course, depending what choice of case you took, then basically uh, it's, it's kind of nice. Um, I, I, I personally look prefer micro ATX because the, the size it has is actually a good contrast in uh, what you can get. Actually, if you have the X299 Micro, uh, which is a pretty solid board that you can actually just micro ADX and you have the two uh, PCI Express slots. And if you use the graphic card and the uh, audio card, for example, well, that's good enough. And most of the people won't be using a PCI Express capture card anymore unless you have your specific cameras for it. And even that, 
even that uh, you have some other devices that can just plug through USB and do it for you if you really want to have the, the capture card. So the main thing is that um, I do prefer micro ATX. I love mini ITXs. Uh, the thing is, it's sometimes hard to find the right balance between what you want and what you actually can get. Uh, but so far, uh, so far, so good. We use the H370 Stinger. Uh, yeah, for the mini ITX no. board, yeah. And we use the dark for for the main uh, for the main platform. That was pretty interesting. And uh, yes, we know how to build PC. And yes, we know the Verge video. Oh uh, yeah, let's not. Talk that about was that. there was actually a lot of questions about that one yesterday. That was but pretty funny. We did it safe. We all had our little band there for static. So obviously, um, all the hardware was safe and. Uh, no risk of uh, static to damage <laughs> components. So we, we, yeah, we, we, we did well, I think, on that side. We, yeah. we applied all the Verge principles. <laughs> all of yeah, them. That, that was a pretty good one. Oh, no, we, we didn't do the thermal paste part. No, because, because the, the thermal the paste was actually built in. It was pre-applied, so we didn't have to worry about that. Uh, there's a whole debate, actually, about pre-applied thermal paste. Uh, different schools on that. If I would not be um, limited by time, I would just remove what's on there and put a, a really good one. But most of the, for most cases, it's fine. It's just um, I like when there's a bit more thermal paste than what it's usually pre-applied with the cooler. So. And for everyone that just joined us on the live, I'm Truthman from Overclocking TV, and this is Xiala from Overclocking TV as well. The secret word, the secret word for today is OCTV. Guess why? Because that's where we came from. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good overview. I, I really enjoyed the panel yesterday. Uh, almost 800 people actually were in the, uh, in the room. That was insane. Uh, quite a huge room mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of support from, uh, from all of you. And actually, if there's any people that are on the stream now that were there yesterday, thank you. That was a, that was a great experience that, uh, that we had. And uh, the time constraint was actually the main challenge that was actually happening at this, uh, at this panel. So we had one hour to get the questions from everyone and build two PC on stage with two screwdrivers. Yeah. Th that, that was the trick. That was the trick. <laughs> we actually, we struggle a bit with that. Uh, ha only having one screwdriver is a, bit, um, is a bit of a challenge, especially with the case we had. We need uh, one of those uh, Allen keys uh, to uh, unmount some of the pieces and without the little um, the little hex thing then it's kind of like uh, impossible so we had to figure out clever ways to unmount some pieces as well so yeah can can you mix thermal paste mix yeah. ourselves no no can you mix different ones oh yeah you can mix whatever i don't know if it's really gonna yield any benefits uh but yeah i mean well, yes you could you could make your own mix and uh, call it uh, you could make make it like your devour kingpin mix and like you just tear it like that and it makes like a nice rainbow on your cpu when you spread it um, talk I saw a question about the kingpin paste actually. Um, so that paste is mainly designed for extreme overclocking as far as I know, the blue paste. Uh, you can use it for regular daily use. Um, I do know that, uh, I don't know if it's the case for the kingpin one, but I know for on the Roman on their Bauer side for the, um, for the thermal grizzly paste. Um, that basically um, the, um, th there, there is a different be, uh, in co in, uh, components between the different pastes and the ones that are made for um, extreme overclocking so overclocking with liquid nitrogen or sub-zero cooling um, those pastes are designed to be running at really cold temperatures uh, and they are not as effective uh, for um, basically transferring uh, heat and doing that thermal interface between the, your CPU and your whatever is your block or your cooler uh, when it's closer to their usual room temperature saying between a range of 30 to 60 80 degrees so in that case go for paste that are adapted for that kind of purpose um, and there, there are a bunch of thermal paste around there to, to do that so and that uh, there was a question have we tried the china cheap thermal paste well toothpaste is pretty mi pretty similar yeah yeah toothpaste nutella whatever you can find that sort of works it's just not recommended. Yeah, at least put something in because the, the the thermal paste is just acting between the CPU and the cooler. So it's just to have like this micro uh, transfer of heat. Uh, you need one. It's very subtle, but you need one. Um, if you're very like have like something that is extremely well uh, no uh, even everywhere, yeah. you can get away without one. But 
still I mean it's okay to have a bad quality I was uh, don't quote me on that but better have a bad terminal base than no terminal base uh, because most of the time yeah. you will never be able to have this super super tiny flat uh, system just sticking together. That, that's sometimes a problem if you buy those uh, cheaper cooters, like especially air cooters that have those heat pipes, um, which are not basically, they are just next to each other and quite flat, but they, they are those, uh, there's this space between the tubes basically, and that's not, not always very even in something. So it's like, in that case, um, yeah, you, you're not gonna have an effective cooling no matter how much or how little or whatever thermal paste you put. So. Actually, having a really flat CPU and a very flat cooler is the very first step of the process. And so most people think uh, buying expensive ca paste is going to solve all your cooling problems. But in most cases, it's just the contact surface that is just really bad. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame the paste in most cases and just actually look at what kind of cooler you have and make sure it's actually flat. And um, yeah, any cooler that is close to 50 bucks uh, you should expect that it will not be a hundred percent flat and properly done. So, and there are many ways to make it work: to sand it, to flatten it, or um, to to make it nice. It's just, yeah, for for all the cheap coolers, it's not the case, and that's where you also have uh, expensive coolers that it doesn't matter if you put a really awesome paste on it or just a regular one. The coolers are so well designed and uh, properly built that you're actually gonna be fine. Well, that's uh, that's a good wrap, I guess. Yeah. We we go over all the terminal base, but that's a that's a question that is coming more and more uh, more often. Oh yeah, and don't forget the peel off the plastic. I just saw the comments. Ah uh, uh, yeah, actually. <laughs> uh, every we, the best of us all made the mistake, so don't worry if you do it, but just make sure you realize you did it quick enough. <laughs> uh, and usually you're gonna realize quick enough that you forgot something. Yeah, know? usually it's like you're starting benchmarks. Like, I, I don't get it. It's not working correctly. It's yeah. weird. Uh, you start the benchmark and it goes straight to 100 degrees and then throttles. Mm. Something is wrong. Yeah. But uh, yeah, as long as you don't have the smell of melted plastic, sometimes you don't realize. So that was another question. Uh, how many sticks of RAM can you run uh, for someone that is a total noob? It depends on the number of RAM slots you have on your motherboard. My yeah. new ITX will be usually limited to two. Uh, the Z390 dark motherboard have two as well, but yeah. most of the Z390 and Z370 motherboard actually have four, uh, four slots. And if you go the route of X299, you will either have four on some of the on the special motherboard, but usually you will go all the way up to eight. Yeah, and that's for consumer boards. And after, if you go to workstation and larger boards, then I mean, th I think sky is the limit. Not not sky is the limit, but you end up with boards with a lot of thin slots. <laughs> um, the important thing about memory, um, as far as the amount of slots goes, is I'd recommend no matter what to always go for two modules. Um, even if you um, say, for example, you only want to go for uh, 8 gigs of RAM or something like that, which is a, st a low amount by today's standards, but kind of like the minimum you should go for. In that case, still go for 2 times 4 gigs uh, in uh, set as a in dual channel memory, basically, rather than going for a single channel 1 8 gig module. So always try to have dual channel, that's sort of like the bare minimum. Uh, it yields a ton of extra performance in terms of uh, memory. Um, it will have a great impact uh, in games in terms of uh, FPS. If you're doing video encoding, it also speeds things up quite a bit. If you're doing streaming on your PC or a lot of like uh, multitasking as well, it helps speed things up uh, like crazy. And it always frustrates me, especially when I see laptops where you only have one, one memory then in there and that all laptops can do dual channel memory but then they put you just one eight gig dim and it's like what the heck it's like come on <laughs> you can just put two times four and it's, it's more expensive yeah but I it's, I like it's a matter of price i think between single and dual channel it's like sometimes like 20 30 percent performance it's like it's in, it's insane um and then you can go for quad and i did a lot of tests for quad because we did uh we do a lot of uh, video rendering for work um, to see basically uh, the impact of quad channel versus uh, dual channel, so having two k two two dims instead of four uh, for quad, and um, the performance impact is actually not that high anymore. I don't know if it's because it's never been really optimized enough to make a, to have an impact, uh, but it's um, in general I, I haven't seen like um, enough 
performance gain from using quad versus dual to make it an incentive to, to, to purchase more. Uh, and then it gets also really expensive as well. So it's like, um, nowadays, how, well we checked the other day, like 32 gigs, so four times uh, eight gigs. Four times eight gigs. For like uh, even 24, what's 2,666. 2, yeah. uh, CL18 was about 220 bucks. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's already fairly expensive. So you need to sort of make sure you actually need that much RAM. Um, I think nowadays with 16 gigs, you're fine to just get two times eight gig and you're pretty much good to go. And then uh, the, the speed of the memory is basically up to your budget from that point. But two times eight, start with that and look what you can afford in that and that kind of like a, that kind of memory range. Mm -hmm. And actually the, the size of the memory will depend on what you do with it. Uh, that's always like that. Yeah, uh, 8 gig is pretty, games, 8 gig is pretty is common for, two, for, yeah. for what we have, like the minimum. Uh, and you can play games and do whatever you want. That's, as long as it's casual, that's all fine. 16 gig is more than enough for 90% of the people. If you go over 16 gigs, it's because you have a special use case. Either you do video encoding, CAD, CAO, uh, or even you have some, uh, like you do gaming and streaming at the same time. So that's where you're gonna need more yeah. uh, more runs for that. But otherwise, I mean, over 16 gigs, usually you don't need that much more than that. And you're gonna see around the internet, you know, you have all those fancy mods and uh, super awesome built PCs, and they all have all the four modules in there. Uh, don't worry about that. Just get two DIMMs as a start. I think uh, you're fine with that. Uh, and actually, if you're building an awesome looking PC and uh, you can't afford the extra two DIMMs, so some vendors propose fake DIMMs, <laughs> <laughs> which are like basically fake memory modules you can just clip in. They have the same RGB or whatever than the other, the, uh, that the other modules you have. And you can just add like two fake DIMMs in there so it looks like you have four modules. Mm. Uh, you can always do that. Um, it doesn't need any performance, but uh, it does look cool, so why not? And uh, you don't have to, to basically um, pay out money to get the like, extra modules you don't need. So. No, actually, in terms of uh, memories, How much 4 gigs, here, yeah. forget about it. 8 gigs, no, yeah. that's the minimum. For, forget 4 gigs. Most that, people that would have 16. 20, yeah, 4 uh. gigs was like 10 years ago. Actually, you know what? We can actually show you why we're saying that. Uh, we have the, the, the gaming PC right next to us. And while we are still downloading some of the stuff we want to do with you guys later down. Uh, so yeah. this is just like running Steam Origin, like no game is running. This is basically inside, uh, it's just the PC running with stuff that you might be running at home. Basically, we have almost four gigs of RAM being used. Four gigs, forget it. It's, it's over. It's been, it's been years. It's over. It's not enough anymore. Eight gig, that's the minimum. 16 gig that's actually the average that everyone would be getting i mean even in laptop today you can get 16 gigs of ram i mean even your cell phone sometimes you get eight or 16 gigs of well RAM. i mean it's a Android cell phone is just not optimized <laughs> <laughs> oh they're the apple user damn it so uh, once you're gonna start playing this will actually ramp up if you do um, video production that's gonna ramp up if you do uh, 3d animation you need more than that you're gonna, you're gonna need high um, high quantity of ram and yeah. then the speed is actually important as well. So what kind of speed we got on this one? The uh, opens. Actually, yeah, yeah, uh, here it's uh, four thousand yeah. two hundred ish, yeah. I guess. Four thousand one thirty three. Would that be the count? So it's a it's 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 pretty good RAM. I mean, decent like four thousand. That's uh, that that's yeah. that's actually on the high end scale. Like most it of the people, we get twenty six sixty six, yeah. three three thousand. Uh, 3200 maybe so memory has been ultra expensive for the last few years uh, there's a whole stock market situation with buying and selling and the amount of uh, and the, the chips of memory that you can buy on the market and uh, the price has been moving around all the time pretty much uh, quite a lot but basically yeah as far as speeds goes um, yeah anything above 3200 uh, is pretty decent I think uh, you can go faster if you can afford faster. That's uh, of course uh, something you can do, but it's not necessarily like a, a deal breaker at this point. Just don't go for 26, 200 uh, uh, to the 2,600 or something like that. That's uh, 2,400. You can still find modules for that, um, and you're probably better off getting like um, faster memory, but maybe a bit less of it than having just a, a lot of it or very slow one. Uh, because you're not gonna use up all the all of it, so you better you sometimes having just I would go on the faster side, but that's maybe just me. 
Um, good question. I had a stick of memory go bad, but I could not figure out which stick was having the error. Is there a way to figure out which team is having the error? Uh, there's multiple ways to do it. Uh, the first one and the first and easy one is remove each of them and test. That's the yeah, but that's not the scientific one though, because it could be a problem also with them slots on the motherboard, or it could be like a bunch of things. It doesn't mean because you're just have one dim it's this one and that's why it works but you you would technically see it right away if the module has an issue and you just have it alone it would not boot up or something like that um, there's another way which is a bit more hardcore it's called Memtest so for that you have to uh, download that online it's like something you put on a bootable USB good 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 everything is going well should we should we wrap up or we can keep going I guess we can keep going <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. If we can, we're gonna do it. Just waiting for the uh, waiting. Don't we're waiting for 3D Mark to be ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what what was I talking about? I forgot. I forgot. Um. Yeah. RAM speed and so on. So it always depends on your on your uh, on your use case and the number of cores on the mainstream platform actually increasing as well. So if we do more core, we're gonna do more things. Oh yeah. We uh -huh. might need more RAM as well. We were talking about testing memory. So yes, yeah. mem test is the actual more scientific way. You just get that. It's free on the internet. Uh, you just boot up on the USB or and sometimes. Um, there might be some biases that integrate some some features for that for troubleshooting. Anyway, you run the test. It, it, you can decide how long you want to run it. Um, I think a good a good length in terms of how long you're gonna run the test is at least 12 hours. So it's kind of like a regular kind of like daily usage, and you're sure you're gonna have no problems. If you really want to do like a stress tests over a long time, 24 or even 48 hours is sort of like a, an extensive testing of it. Uh, but Memtest is good, it's going to really quickly point out which module has what issue and it's designed to also be running the test even with failing modules. So the test won't fail by running the test because there's no point to test in Windows uh, stuff that will maybe make the test fail and then you don't know exactly what failed and it's going like, to... Um, so it needs to be sort of like an independent scientific way of doing it. So um, that's what I would do. Uh, one, one cool thing about memory and that's why I also always recommend people to buy memory from either Corsair or HyperX or Kingston or any of the big brands is that most of their kits are warranted for life and people forget about that but just keep the receipt of all the memory you buy and in most cases you will have no issues in the future to exchange them if you have any problems with it. Uh, and a lot of people don't know that and uh, it's too bad because you can actually save a lot of money and it happens to me like maybe after two three years um, one of my dims has some issues it does happen um, and then yeah if it's warranty for life you just bring the kit back to the shop or bring it back to RMA and they just swap it and in most cases they don't end up having stock of your old kit so they just give you whatever is the standard for today and you can, if you're lucky, get from an 8 gig, uh, like a 2 times 4 gig from a few years ago, which is like 2400, and then basically switch to uh, something that's like maybe like 2 times 8, like uh, 2600 or something like that. So it might be a, actually a good way to get a, a cheap and free upgrade um, if you are in the bad luck having issue with your memory. Uh, that's also why also memory has good resale value as well, especially the, from the big brands. Uh, let me skim quickly through the questions. Um, no, no, it's not this. This mouse. Can you vacuum your motherboard to clean it? Yeah, I would avoid that. Actually, I'm more into blowing stuff on it, blowing uh, like dry air from uh, dry air cans, uh, than vacuuming stuff. Nowadays, motherboards don't really have that many moving parts, so technically, you would not have too many issues vacuuming it as long as you use you know like the brush for cleaning vacuuming couches and things like that uh, but uh, yeah I mean like I would avoid uh, vacuuming a motherboard it's I just, just a probably a recipe for disaster if you if you want my opinion just just blow dry air if you have a compressor at home then use that it's even better um, you know once a year you just open your case blow a bit everywhere um, <laughs> One thing, if you blow air with a compressor because the pressure is so high, make sure that you hold uh, you hold the, um, your fans, so you hold them with your fingers. 
so the hot air just don't blow on it and like basically uh, maybe put pressure on the bearings and things like that where you could <laughs> yeah 120 psi definitely that's that's a lot of pressure to put onto something that has a uh, rolling bearings like fan so try to to not go hardcore and i mean we are blowing dust it's not like you're trying to do anything else <laughs> um if your board is too dirty even still about that there's always uh the dishwasher option um, that's yeah, something right, okay, I recommend as well. This one is not um, recommended, but. <laughs> but I mean, if it's really dirty to that point, uh, you can always try that, but I wouldn't do it, yeah. <laughs> can you recommend any, into any the free software to help uh, Windows 10 users tweak uh, their OS settings, uh, more efficiency on memory, etc.? So, there are a few software out there that are basically helping you not to uh, tweak the OS in terms of efficiency, but they will tweak basically your CPU and your motherboard operating frequency. And then you're just starting to overclock. So um, uh, there's the Intel XCU software, which is sort of like an all-in-one tool that runs in Windows, has a stress test included and all like a bunch of dials that works if you have an Intel CPU. If you have an AMD one, there's also a tool for that. Uh, which is called Watman. Um, then EVGA, for example, has a tool for graphics card, uh, Precision X, which is also able to do some of that on the graphics card side of things. A lot of the memory efficiency and memory tweaking as far as overclocking goes can be done within Windows. It's something you have to do in the BIOS. Um, a no-brainer would be to run XMP, which is the extreme memory profiles for memory, which is like a, sort of like a pre-baked, pre-overclocked sort of standard for memory. Uh, it's uh, Most of the memory kits support that nowadays, so just buy that if you have an Intel platform and just activate XMP in your BIOS. Uh, check for compatibility first. Most motherboard vendors website have a list of the compatible memory that goes with it. Make sure to check that. Um, and then after that, you're gonna really push it really far. So you're gonna have to dial into timings and uh, all those things that are like, uh, very precise tweaking things for, for memory and um, yeah, it's more complex, it's more complex. So only do that if you know what you're doing, but that's one way of uh, overclocking your memory um, and yeah. Pretty good and just for you guys to know, we are at Xiala and True from Overclocking TV and we're reading the comments from everywhere, like either YouTube, Twitch or Mixer. Uh, there's a lot of comments on all the platforms, so we're trying to get them all the way through it. Um, I think we we can do a wrap up just for the the overall discussion and show we'll keep getting questions uh in the next few minutes but um just for everyone that join us you can always find us at uh, overclocking tv so twitch.tv slash overclocking tv and youtube.com slash overclocking tv in one word uh we do stream every week on friday afternoon around uh, 2 p.m around eastern. 2 p.m eastern so that's yeah. about like 7 to 8 p.m in europe and uh, we do the OMG, so Overclock Mod Game uh, Show, where we usually have uh, guests that actually uh, discuss with us about the latest uh, trends in the industry as well as uh, how they end up in there. And otherwise, you can find us on Twitter, yes. twitter.com slash overclocking TV. Basically, it's overclocking TV in one word pretty much anywhere. Everywhere, even on Instagram, even though we're not really active there, but uh, you can follow us there. Um, yeah, make sure to follow us mostly, especially on Twitch and YouTube, because if you want to join the show, if you have more questions like that, that's exactly what that show is for. Uh, it's a show for PC enthusiasts, PC lovers, everyone that is into overclocking, PC modding and everything. And like you mentioned, we have some cool guests every week. Um, we had, for example, the winner of the Build.gg uh, mod contest, the 10K contest last week. Um, and it's uh, very insightful. So if you guys are interested into learning more and following us there, we'd really appreciate it. Well, so yeah, we're, we're still here. Don't worry, yeah, we're gonna take more questions. Um, yes, we take the questions when they're actually uh, uh, bringing. It's going very quick on the chat because yeah. it's all three chats combined. So we try to, to keep <laughs> up with everything. So if we haven't answered your question from five minutes ago, just post it again. No, no. We're not gonna kick ban anyone for that. So what what is the hardware on the test rig that we have? And actually, we're still installing some of the software because uh, there was a lot of games, but yeah. not a lot of uh, overclocking tools that we could have. Uh, do you have CPUZ that we can uh, actually show? Uh, this will be like more like a back and forth uh, trying to overclock that system uh, down the road. Yeah. Not gonna be touching the CPU. Just gonna be touching the the VGA for the fun. 
So hardware in that PC, uh, starting off with CPU, we got a Core i9-9900K, so a ninth generation Core i CPU from Intel. So those CPUs are part of the Extreme series of CPUs, so uh, they are CPUs that are made for uh, uh, enthusiast gamers or uh, enthusiast PC users, people that need uh, extreme performance. So those are CPUs um, that basically have is that the stock frequency here, 5 gigahertz? I don't, uh, it yeah, yeah, no. it's supposed to be is 5. Okay. No, not 5.2, but 5. Well, it's, yeah, it's oscillating around it. So basically, you have, your, you have the turbo that also sort of like kicks in as well. Uh, so those CPUs are high-end CPUs. Um, and here we have an engineering sample. That's why it says ES in the CPUs at Windows, but you don't have to worry about that. Uh, in terms of motherboard, so we have the EVGA uh, Z390 Dark. This is their new board. Uh, it's the one designed by Kingpin himself. So Kingpin, who's the um, in-house extreme overclocker at EVGA. Uh, and they have a team there at EVGA that is building those crazy motherboards. And if you are looking for some of the best boards in the world, this is definitely one of them. Uh, it has some awesome features in terms of uh, power delivery to the CPU, power delivery to multiple GPUs. Uh, voltage regulations, everything is high quality, well designed and fallout out stuff. So that's that's really one cool board. Um, then in terms of memory, so we have uh, some DDR4, 16 gigs. So it's two times eight gigs uh, on this specific board here. Um, the brand of the module is uh, I think it's XPG. XPG, which is the, the gaming brand of A Data. Uh, so it's uh, I I don't know if it's really that famous in North America. Uh, XPG. Uh, I do know in Asia, in Asia they're pretty is, strong, um, yeah. is a pretty strong brand. Um, Adata, you probably know them from their, from their thumb drives, their uh, external hard drives and things like that. Uh, that memory here is sporting uh, Samsung chips. So Samsung uh, for um, DRAM and memory chips. Uh, it's good quality stuff as well. So it's one of the major providers for memory chips as well. Um, and then, so basically for the graphic side, we have one graphics card on that system. It's a RTX 2080 Ti, and yes, it just works. Um, this card basically is the, the Kingpin Edition card from EVGA. Uh, again, Kingpin, so in-house uh, extreme overclocker at EVGA. So this is the card um, actually designed for uh, the most demanding PC enthusiasts out there. Uh, especially if you're looking at overclocking your graphics cards, uh, EVGA has a bunch of tools. Um, one of them, which I already sort of mentioned, which is Precision X, um, which is basically uh, EVGA's overclocking software for his uh, for their graphics card. It's I love it. The, they redone the whole interface like not so long ago, actually, like maybe a year or something ago. Um, and uh, I really love it. It's all visual. You can see which areas you're tweaking, if it's the memory. So actually, if you actually don't know how a graphics card is done, that's where you learn that, okay, those things here, this is those are the memories on my graphics card. Um, so the RAM of your graphics card here, this is the GPU. So that's kind of like a, a CPU equivalent of for your graphics card. So graphical processing units. And then the target here, so that's for the power delivery. So that's the power delivery size of your card. And every graphics card is done the same. The power delivery is always on the right back. That's basically in alignment with the power connector that you plug on the top. Uh, Precision X includes all kinds of uh, other features now, such as the LED things that you show. And there's also uh, hardware monitoring as well, which is uh, essential if you're going to try to do overclocking. Uh, you never just overclock randomly and go brute force and try to get some I don't know, you know, like, to, oh yeah, I overclocked extra megahertz, but I have no clue what, what the heck this is doing. So if you're going to overclock, always like uh, figure out what is sort of your base clock or base, uh, base performance and then escalate from there and start raising up the clocks. Um, and then in terms of overclocking your graphics card, it's actually very simple. It's actually mo pr probably even more simple than overclocking your CPU because you have less dials to play with. When you overclock a CPU, you're talking about overclocking, for instance, uh, you have the multipliers, you have to take care of the multiple different kinds of voltages, um, you have the, the cache uh, ratios as well to overclock the cache, etc., etc. So if you, have the, you have a bunch of things that you can consider. Um, for overclocking graphics card, you have two main things, so the memory, 
which is this slider here, which can, you can actually just quickly try out, and the clock speed uh, of the GPU as well as the, um, the voltage, the, so the extra voltage you add to the GPU. Um, now the way you would now want to do if you wanted to overclock your GPU is the first thing you do, you run like a software like 3D Mark at stock, uh, which will give you like a score um, for your overclock. So right now we're still installing 3D Mark. I think we have to wait if we wanted to do a run. But basically you do that first run, it's gonna be your, um, your baseline run. It will give you a score and this is what your card can do at stock. The next thing you do, you open Precision X here in this case and you just start cranking up uh, GPU clock. Just crank it up by maybe 10 or 20 megahertz every single time. And then you apply the settings. Don't change any voltage from the starts. Just try to increase the, the frequencies. And once you have a higher frequency, then you can basically uh, run the benchmark again and see if you get a higher score. And you can just keep going like that until you maybe have a crash or you have some graphical glitches, That's like some artifacts. And that means you something is unstable and you maybe need to add voltage or maybe compensate something with memory as well. Or increase the power targets on, uh, on the target thing for the power it delivery. It's very important though that you always test your performance increase. The main reason for that is, especially on the RTX and the latest hardware, there's auto safety that kicks in all the time. Some of them you can't even remove them. And especially for the, the RTX, uh, yeah, just a minute. Uh, the RTX is that it will keep you into this power and temperature box. There's no way you can get out of it. So if you overclock too high, it will try to go too high and then it will just level up. So sometimes you keep increasing, but you don't get any more performances. So it's useless. Uh, just for you guys, the um, secret word is OCTV. And we're going to do the giveaway in the next few minutes. Um, how long do we have to wait, Jacob? Like five, five, five minutes? minutes? Two minutes from now. So maybe when you see that on your platform, that's going to be over already. So secret word is OCTV. So and that's how you enter the, the raffle. Basically. Yeah. And um, there was this question on how, how should you overclock uh, your Amazon? Mm -hmm. No, not yet. Ah, well, actually, we could. Like, yep, there. All right, do we have to show a screen or something or just say, do the drum roll? All right, oh, all right. Okay, th that's, that's close. Are you, Tim, you ready? Yes. So, the winner of the, is that the Z390 or X? X299 motherboard, oh my God, X299 dark. So. And the winner is. Okay, uh, that's uh, going to be Jacob announcing that. Hello. Did you guys miss me? <laughs> the winner of the X299 Dark Motherboard is S-P-R-E-Y-N on Twitch. S-P-R-E-Y-N. Congratulations, you have won an EVGA X299 Dark Motherboard. Whoops. Motherboard, there we go. Oh, yeah. All right, I'll see you guys in a bit. So, congratulations! All right, so well, that was it. That was a, that was nice, Rafael. Oh, okay. So we are being so we are being kicked out of our own takeover. That's actually funny. That's, um, that's okay. That's so we okay. need to do a stream with just cloaking the card. Yeah, we should do that. Uh, maybe we could do that for one of the OMG shows one day. Yep. Um, we'll talk to Jacob to send us some samples there to arrange something. Right? To do a live test. He, he said yes. He said yes. So um, it's all good, guys. Just we say yes. Yeah, just say yes. You say yes. 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 Yeah, he said, he said yes. yes. So, so that's going to so happen. We're going to do that, guys. So make sure you uh, head over to um, <laughs> 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 head over to either the youtube.com slash overclocking TV or twitch.tv slash overclocking TV and subscribe to the channels. And uh, once we will do a stream about how to overclock that, and maybe we'll have also some cool swag from EVGA to give away on that occasion. So make sure to follow, uh, follow us there. I think that's pretty much it for today's stream. We are being uh, kicked over here. There will be another team. Who's the next? Um, Who will be next? 
So the next streamer is 4-3 Flip. Four three Harm flip. and Gelatinous. Oh, yeah, that's the small game that looks awesome. Oh, cool. So, so they will be uh, taking yeah. over, guys, in a few minutes from now. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. If you don't have anything uh, to eat, just order something with Uber. They will knock at your door and, and give you the food. Don't go anywhere. Just stay there. By the way, this advertisement was not sponsored by anyone, uh, nor even EVG, actually. Uh, we are from Overclocking TV. Everything that we said is our own opinion. Uh, there was no exchange of money or anything for us to be here. We just wanted to share our passion with you guys. So, really hope that is actually it works. So, thank you very much, guys, and uh, we will find you again on maybe another show or Thanks, on guys. the Overclocking TV channel. Bye. Bye. -bye.